I tell you what, we're all glad to be here and, uh, you know, kind of glad. I don't think the storms were as bad as predicted. And, uh, you know, I think we came through okie dokie. Tell you what, let's just uh, wait a minute for the city manager and uh, then we'll get rolling. Uh, <laughs> he has a beautiful blue suit on. It's the safest room in the, in the city. Yeah, I never got his blue suit. Horseshoes. He's <laughs> right there. Yeah. You're right. Okay, uh, today our first briefing is going to be on the ind uh, Independent uh, Citizen Review Board update, and that is requested by. Uh, you know, Council Member Wooten, and uh, we have Regina, Regina Hillard and Rod Ingram going to, you know, get, uh, give us a status report on that. Thank you, folks. Thank you. The city code provides that the Independent Citizen Review Board, which would provide oversight over the police department, that, those, that the board shall be composed of 11 voting members and two non-voting members. The requirements for the members are that they be eligible to vote, that they reside in the city of Virginia Beach, and that they reflect the demographic diversity of the city. On subsequent slides, we'll talk about disqualifiers, but first let's talk about reflecting the demographic diversity of the city. State law requires that the board reflect the demographic diversity of the city, but state law does not define that term. The task force that you appointed uh, considered various aspects of demographic diversity, and based on that, they made recommendations which are now part of the city code. And those recommendations say that appointees should reflect the racial, gender, gender identity, and socioeconomic diversity of the city's population. So to help us make sure that we're meeting the diversity requirements that state code and city code have already set up, we're using the U.S. Census data, and that data will give us information that we will then use to provide recommendations, or the panel will use to make, provide recommendations to the city council. So, for example, on the race and ethnicity, using an 11-member panel, we will be using the census data and we'll be trying to recommend uh, six individuals that will be white, uh, we'll have two that are African-American and so forth. So we want our panel to be representative of the community that they will be serving. So that's what the diversity element is there for. Uh, we will also have census data on sex. Now, the census data tells us male and female. If the applicants want to go further and get more information on gender identity, that will be welcomed as well because, again, we're after having a panel, a, a board, that is going to be representative of our community. So we want that diversity information. Uh, we will have information on income. That is something else that would, can be used. We have the tiers here for our use. And then this is going to be one that is going to be interesting. Uh, we're asking for, City Council is asking for two individuals, at least two individuals, that will be under the age of 40. Now, if you look at the statistics uh, on the chart, you'll see, well, that should be easy to get. We have, you know, an ample number to select from. But think about 40-year-olds, that age group. A lot of time spent with work, a lot of time spent with family. So we may not have the uh, applicants that we want to have so that we can have a good selection of those individuals under 40. But we're striving to, to have that. We want to have uh, those two individuals that are under 40. So we are working towards that as we speak. All right, and then there are some state law disqualifiers that Rod has been having some fun with. Oh, yes, thank you. The state law provides that any person who currently serves as a law enforcement officer, as defined by state law, is ineligible to serve on the oversight board. 
The state law defines law enforcement officer as any employee of a police department or sheriff's office, which is a part of uh, the state or a political subdivision, a town, city, or county, or any private police department, and who is responsible for the prevention and detection of crime and the enforcement of penal, traffic, and highway laws, and also that it shall include a laundry list of state level agents such as ABC special agents and lottery investigators and DMV enforcement officers and the other state officers that you see listed there. So it's a very broad definition with respect to law enforcement officers uh, who work for the state or who work for a locality in Virginia. The disqualifier does allow a retired law enforcement officer to serve, but only as an advisory officio <coughs> non-voting member. And it requires that such law enforcement officer shall not have previously been employed as a law enforcement officer by the city, but shall have been employed as a law enforcement officer in a locality similar to the city. The city code also has disqualifiers. Uh, I've divided these into sections, criminal and non-criminal. Uh, the criminal ones um, are that you may not serve on the board if any of the following apply. If you are a convicted felon, unless your rights have been restored and the felony conviction did not involve moral turpitude, which is lying, cheating, or stealing, a sex offense, domestic assault, offenses involving children as victims, and gun violations or any crime of violence. Also ineligible to serve would be a person convicted of any misdemeanor involving moral turpitude, sex offenses, domestic assault, or offenses involving children as victims or gun violations. If the person is currently or previously subject to a protective order, if they have had multiple DUI convictions within 10 years, or if they have any pending criminal charges or adjudication. You'll recall that the types of records that members of this panel will have access to include criminal investigative files and personnel information, highly confidential information, information about victims. Um, so it's understandable why the task force uh, recommended these disqualifiers. The non-criminal disqualifiers are cannot be a public office holder or a candidate for public office, cannot be employed by or an immediate family member of someone who is employed by the city, but could be a voting member if they honorably separated from city service for at least five years. No current employee of any law enforcement agency no one with a less than honorable discharge from the military, no one with outstanding judgments or pending litigation against the city by the appointee or by one of their immediate family members or pending litigation against a law enforcement officer by an appointee or one of their immediate family members. So once we have gotten through the diversity elements and uh, the disqualifiers, the panel will be ready to I recommend appointments to the board. Now, of course, there's a new board, so all of the members are going to be starting at the same time, but we don't want them to all end at the same time, and then we'll start with another new board. So the appointments are planned to be staggered appointments. So we will have four for three years, four for two years, and so forth. And that goes for the voting members as well as the non-voting members. After those initial appointments, all of the appointments will then be for three years. So right now, the panel is in the process of interviewing candidates. They've already started interviews. They have more interviews to conduct. Uh, in the process of conducting the interviews, the paperwork is given to the candidate so that they can go to the police department to go ahead and have their fingerprint check and their uh, criminal background check completed. Uh, and they are, once all of that is done and they are ready to make recommendations to the council, once those appointments have been made by council, we will start the training. The training has already been created by our police department. It is a very comprehensive training. Uh, and it should be about 45, 48 hours. It's about 35 hours or so that is in 
classroom, so to speak, and then there's another 10 hours that is associated with ride-alongs uh, with our officers. So we want them to have a good feel for what they will be looking at when the time comes to review those cases. So that training is already planned and underway. But I do want to make sure that it is understood that we are still accepting applications for this board. So we want individuals to continue to submit the application so that uh, the panel can have the opportunity to review those, have more interviews, and get the best panel that we can uh, for this board. Now, if this uh, presentation is posted, that's the link that will lead you to the Talent Bank application. Any of our citizens who want to uh, actually apply can just follow that link. Otherwise, go to VBGov and uh, just search for ICRB and it will take you directly to that Talent Bank application. All right, so are there any questions? Hey, any questions? You know, don't say no. Are you going to wait to, to um, appoint all 11, have all 11, or kind of go as you, kind of as you come? You're going to try to seat all 11 at one time, or if you only get 10, can you keep it moving? It's council's prerogative, but I would think that with 10, you could keep moving. 11 was selected, so we'd have an odd number in case it's a close uh, vote. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you could go forward with all the 10. And we also want to, since the training is so protracted, mm -hmm. that, that long training, we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to go through the training together if possible. So great. Hey, anyone else at this point? Sabrina. Thank you. And um, I certainly do appreciate the, the update that's been provided. Um, I do apologize a bit to the public, though, because I certainly want to make sure the public is updated uh, on a continuous basis. And I don't believe they've had an update since we accepted and approve the task force recommendations. Um, but I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm a bit concerned. I am because uh, I don't want this ICRB ending up becoming uh, the council member Rosemary Wilson ICRB. And I say that because since the very beginning, I see an interview committee that's formed and, 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 and I'll say, I don't want it to be any specific council member's body, because it should be a collective group working towards doing this. But when I see an interview committee that was predominantly led by one particular council member, and we're being told who's on that committee, and then selecting former Chief Jaycox, Jake Jaycox, who the minority committee or the minority residents don't really have a favorable um, out view and outlook of him. Not saying that he's a bad person, but that would not be their first choice of someone as a chair of an interview committee who's selecting some of the folks to be considered for this board. And so, you know, I, I also become concerned when I hear from some folks who say they were told by the council member to apply. That concerns me because now I'm thinking, are we truly being independent here or are we not? You know, it's a process. And when there's a truly independent process, you go through that process. You don't come to folks and say, well, you have a list of folks you want to be on that board. That's not the way you conduct business. And some people might say, well, you know, I've recommended folks to be on a board or committee. What's wrong with that? No, for an independent citizens review board, you can't do that. You can't pick who you want, who you think is good and tell them to go try out for it. It has to truly be independent. You know, that's why we're asking for more applications. And I am accountable to the people because when it's all said and done, when the people and the residents see what we come up with, um, we all have to be accountable for what they see. And this has to be a board that's truly 
independent that's going to work on the behalf of the people and investigate some serious cases. And so I, like I said, I'm, I'm concerned about it. I'm, I'm going through this process and, you know, this is quite a few things I'm seeing that, that make me a bit concerned, you know, going forward, knowing this process is really supposed to be truly independent, transparent. So those, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Anyone else, Barbara? Well, I guess as the other council person appointed to this committee, I need to make some comments. I'm, I have an entirely different view, I'm afraid. Uh, it's, it's better if we always agree, but it's also okay if we disagree from now and then so we can get things right. But I really True. feel very encouraged by this process. Uh, this interview committee was approved by the council uh, with two council members and two members of the original, of the task force. Uh, and uh, of course, there was a long delay in uh, developing a new talent bank application, which allowed the applicants to apply, knowing what these disqualifiers were and so forth, because it is a different application than what we have otherwise, because we're asking some information that we don't normally ask. Uh, and so we did have a, a, a delay in uh, developing the talent bank application, and then the talent bank applications have been out there for a while until we have gotten a, a really good uh, list group of people who have applied. Uh, the committee uh, of four uh, has had three meetings, I think, uh, and we have uh, are looking at all of the applications we have at this point. As uh, Ms. Hilliard said, there are still applications being accepted. Um, and in looking at the demographics of the city and what we are expected to uh, have on this committee, uh, it, is, it is a different process from what we usually do because like I say, we usually don't uh, ask for these, this information from people that we uh, appoint, but at this, these requirements to have the demographics reflected and to have a, a look at all of these disqualifiers makes us have to do a, a much more in-depth uh, look at all of the applicants, but please be assured we're looking at every single application uh, and uh, and are beginning the interviews. Uh, how many we interview, but we I'm not exactly sure to tell you how at what point we'll send the, the list to you folks. But this body is going to be the body that determines who is appointed. Uh, this committee is simply reviewing uh, these applications interviewing, giving you our best comments, because I don't think this body wants to go through all of this, looking to make sure all of these disqualifiers are met and so forth. That's just what this committee is doing, trying to come up with uh, where we would stand in, in meeting all of these requirements that, that are set for this committee. But please be assured this body is going to be the body that determines who is on that committee. This interview committee is simply doing some uh, preliminary work to look at the applicants for you and, um, and make those recommendations. And I hope that we can have that to you shortly uh, so that you can, can make that decision. But one of the things I'm looking for uh, when I'm looking at these applications is to make certain that the people that we're recommending to you are independent and uh, and meet these these requirements and um, and I think the training is going to be so critical uh, for the success of, of this committee because they have to know an awful lot and to understand that and we're certainly not getting into any part of that that's going to come after you have selected uh, the, the 11 people you want to appoint uh, and it's very likely that some of these people may get part of the way through that training and decide, I don't think I want to go any further. And so that's why we need to continue to get other applicants because some of these people may decide along the way that they simply drop out. So it will be a process, an ongoing process. And uh, maybe it's just because I tend to be an optimist, but I think it looks like it's coming together very well. And I think we're going to have some good recommendations for you. Okay. And the, the chairman was chosen by your body, correct? Right. The, the committee chose the chairman. Right. Okay, so Bernie. 
Let me just say, though the chairman was chosen by the body, before that, I had to ask the attorney to let him know that he wasn't already selected because he was told, he said by you, vice chair, that he was going to be the chair. So it had to correct that because no one of this body can come can appoint a chair to any board. No council member should be appointing that. So he had to change that. And yes, he was accepted. I didn't vote for him because I didn't feel that was necessary. But let's be honest, because that's what I'm here to do, to be, I, you know, I not that I'm not an optimist. I just call it like I see it. That's what I saw. You know, and most folks may not, may not understand it, but I saw, I know what I saw. I read the email. I saw what happened. Um, and in terms of the committee being selected, it, we were just told who was going to be on the board. We, we didn't have a, a say so of who was going to be selected. We were just told, you know, and so here we are, but that's not a transparent process uh, when it comes to selecting you know, this overall body. And I will continue to keep you updated on things that I see um, and call it out as it is. Otherwise, we continue to do things this way. It's, it's not transparent. It's not what the people ask for. And I work for the people and I'm going to tell the truth about it. Okay, Aaron and then Rosemary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to add to the conversation that um, I'm really proud of Council Member Wooten's work with getting the CRB to where it is now. You know, she fought extremely hard to get this board uh, and this committee enacted. It was a very close vote. In the late Lewis Jones, Councilman Lewis Jones was a tie-breaking vote that they gave to approve. I believe it was a 6-5 vote. And so with that being said, uh, you know, I always felt as though when a council member had an initiative that they fight very hard for, it, then they should be, they should lead on that initiative. But it seems as though Councilmember Wooten has been on the back end of making decisions when it comes to this, this board. I say that because when we first heard about the, the committee or the council board that was going to be two members um, uh, appointed to this board to pick who's going to go on the IRP or decision review board, Councilmember Wooten had to basically speak up and had to fight to be that third person on this board which I was proud to, uh, to to support her in that effort. But that being said, um, I think a lot of what she has to say has legitimacy. And so I think we should listen and we should take her lead on, on this thing. Uh, not saying that you know, everyone has an opportunity to make recommendations to the board, but it's something she fought for. So she's very passionate about it and I think we should follow her. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think there's some misunderstanding when I talked to Chief Jay Cox, and uh, in fact, I told him, I can't appoint you. It has to be either the council do it or the committee itself. That's why I asked if the committee itself made him chair. And so that was a misunderstanding. I don't think there's anything in writing or anything that will show that I said, you will be chair. So I'm sorry about the misunderstanding that occurred. And once he realized, you know, it, but he did have a lot. He, he actually wrote the plan, and he knows it very, very well. And I think he is a very able leader, and I'm sure he's doing a good job. And I think it's up to all of us, if we see people in the community, because we're having a hard time filling all those slots, if we see anybody, we can encourage them to send in their talent bank for them. Um, but I... Haven't had anything to do with the interview teams or anything. I, I really think there's right, and, and I think it's it's clear. I think some people are referring to that as a board, but it's just a committee. You yeah. had a similar interview group to to determine who we were going to select for the uh, bond referendum review committee. Right. It's exactly in that same fashion. Uh, they uh, interviewed applicants and made recommendations to the council for that committee. And this is just an interview committee. It is not a, uh, a board. I was just a team. Well, I, 
I'll just say this. You know, I it, it is in writing. Whether he misunderstood what you said, we, there was clearly a conversation. And so when I saw the email, I reached out to staff and I said, how can this happen? And he certainly looked at Robertson Rules. Robertson Rules says that you can't do that. And so he reached out to let you know and Chief Jaycox as well about not being able to be in that position or you being able to put him in that position. So it is in writing because when I saw it, I addressed it with staff and said, this doesn't seem quite right. And so after that point, he mentioned he addressed it with you and so then we moved forward. But it didn't look right. Turns out it wasn't right. And then we went forward. But again, you got to follow the policies and you got to follow the rules here. You know, and if, if you see something that's not right, you should say something. And I think that's, that's important. And I think in terms of who you, I, don't, I haven't asked anybody to be a part of the board because I want it to be truly independent. I want it to come from uh, people who are really interested in seeing the city address these issues because it is one of the most profound uh, pieces of legislation that we've done as a body to make sure we have an independent citizens review board. And so I'm not gonna go and ask and recruit folks. I want people to come to the table who wanna do it, who have a passion, who understand it. But when I'm sitting at a table and someone says, well, Council Member Rosemary told me I would be a good fit and to apply, that gives me pause for reserve. And it doesn't sound right, it's not right. And that's not how you operate in making sure that you have a clearly independent ICRB. I don't care what you say, how, to, how you can try to roll over it, try to make it sound. No, that's not right. You have to do it the right way. Otherwise, the, the people who we're working for, when they see what we come up with, they're not going to have, there's not going to be any credibility in it, and they're not going to trust us. And that's what it's, building an independent CRB is about building trust with the community. Don't undermine that in the process. That's it. It's trust. Build the trust with the community. You do that by being transparent. You do that by operating through the process. You do that by uh, making sure it's transparent, keeping the people updated. That builds trust. But when you undermine the process, you're doing the people a disservice. And that's not what I'm here to do. Hey, anybody else at this point? Uh, uh, but you know, before we uh, move on, let's just say this. I think it's an important thing that, you know, you know, we do take this very seriously. You know, I think we have been, we've been deliberate. It's taken a while to get to this point. Uh, this is a, you know, has some, ex you know, a special conditions that go with it in terms of, you know, requirements and what's going to be needed, time commitments or anything. But the thing is, I think one thing we could all agree on, that we are the ultimate decision makers who will get appointed to this board. And, you know, let's just be you know positive and say we're going to, you know, get the right people on. OK, thank you very much. All right. Mr. Dehaney. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, Police Chief Lutigay will provide to you council an update on various initiatives, including technology and staffing and recruitment for the police department, as well as a preliminary crime stats update. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. Thank you for this opportunity 
come in and, and update you in regards to uh, talk about technology today. We're going to talk about recruiting and give a brief crime update. Um, what I would like to do is before we get started is uh, I have a number of staff here with me today, so I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first and foremost, um, we've got Captain Zelms uh, right behind you. Captain Zelms is currently in charge of our training bureau, but for the last 18 months, he has really done a fantastic job. He was our technology bureau commander, and I think what we're going to present today, you're going to be very impressed. So I owe Captain Zelms and Afton Oglesby a, a debt of gratitude for their great work. Uh, next to him is uh, Deputy Chief Wichendall, who is now in charge of our investigations. So Detective Bureau, Special Investigations. Uh, running the uh, computer is my executive aide, Lieutenant Wessler. Behind him is our new uh, recruiting commander, Lieutenant James Gordon. We've got, uh, let's see. Deputy Chief Adams in the back. We've got Melissa from PAO and Lieutenant Sanyer. And have I missed, oh, I did miss one. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our new Chief Communications Officer, Ms. Jody Saunders. So Ms. Saunders will lead our Public Affairs Unit, focusing on strategic communications, both internal and external, community engagement, and of course, media relations. So she has recently located to us from Charlottesville. She brings with her over 20 years of experience in public relations, strategic communications, media relations, and graphic design. Uh, most recently, she was the director of public relations for Jaunt, a public transit organization serving seven municipalities in Central Virginia. She spent several years in the Albemarle County's communications office where she was responsible for leading and developing effective communication and community relations activities. Uh, so she's had plenty of crisis communications exposure in both positions. She has a BA in graphic design from James Madison and a master's in communications from the Virginia Commonwealth University. So if we take uh, opportunity and please welcome Jody to the city. So first, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Captain Zelms to, to talk about recruiting, um, I'm sorry, technology. One of the things when we talk about recruiting, and I talk to our lateral hires, they come to us and they give us great feedback. Chief, it's a great department. It is a great city. We like the people we work with. We're supported by this community. We're supported by this council. But what about the technology? Our technology, where I came from, is better than what we had. So what I hopefully you're going to see is over the last two years, we have done, Captain Zelms and a number of people have done a very, very good job of trying to drag us out of the technology stone. Age. So, Captain Zelms, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chief. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what I'm about to talk to you about represents the last 18 months of hard work that not only makes your officers better equipped and more efficient, uh, but also makes your city a safer place to live, work, and play. So first, I'd like to thank each of you, because without the support, we wouldn't have been able to uh, go, go along with these endeavors. And also, the uh, partnership with Mr. Peter Wallace and Information Technology was greatly appreciated. Uh, it was a lot of effort on their part as well. So the first... The first slide that I'll get into is ShotSpotter. I think that everybody's heard of it. It was a uh, long overdue effort in which we recognized the need to address gun crime violence throughout our city. It was a phased in deployment through July, of, uh, July and September of 2021. We started with four square miles of coverage, uh, two square miles in the ocean front and two square miles in the Western Bayside area. It's important to recognize that those areas were identified not because we thought that they were important, but because that's where the gun crime data showed we needed to be. With that gun crime data, we're also planning an expansion in the first and fourth precincts in the coming months. Some of the successes of ShotSpotter. In the second precinct coverage area alone since July 14th, 2021, we've had 120 activations capturing 353 rounds of gunfire. We've recovered 120 shell casings, 
and we received corresponding 911 calls <laughs> only 18% of the time. I'll, I'll go back to that number in a second. For the third precinct coverage area, we started September 20, 29th, 2021. We've had 283 activations, representing 887 rounds of gunfire. We've recovered 382 shell casings, and we've only received a corresponding 911 call 26% of the time. Those numbers are important because I'd actually like to point out that compared to the national average, that's very good. Nationally, we're in the low teens of corresponding 911 calls. That means the vast majority of the time when there's gunfire in a community, people don't call the police. And when I talk to community, community groups and uh, different bodies, I'd like to say that we want to respond, but we need to know. We need to know when there's trouble in an area. We need to know when gunfire is present so that we can respond and we can take action. So with the implementation of ShotSpotter, an important thing is we respond to gunfire in these areas every time. Our officers are there uh, within minutes of gunfire. So within 45 seconds, typically, uh, an alert is sent to our officers on their mobile devices and we go to the dot. So it tells us exactly where we need to be in the area to search. Now we might not always find a person but at least the community knows that we care, that we're responding, that we're trying to, to, try to intervene in gun violence. Uh, some important numbers. Since the go-live date, in total, we've made 21 arrests off of those alerts, and we've also recovered 24 guns. So there's real value in this system. The great part about technology is, in, in the different pieces that I'm gonna discuss, is how they work together. So responding to gunfire is one part of a overall gun crime reduction strategy. But when you combine it with other efforts that we're doing, such as the NIBIN brass track system that we've, we've uh, implemented, it really puts us in a comprehensive uh, strategy for attack on gun crime violence. So NIBIN is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, and brass tracks is the machine that helps compare and contrast the shell casings that we recover. So when we talked about the hundreds of shell casings that we recover based on shot spotter alerts or other crimes within the city, we now have the ability to enter these into our own system. And instead of <coughs> taking six to nine months for the Department of Forensic Science to analyze that and give us res results, we're now able to get those results within 72 hours. That's a, a dramatic improvement. It vastly increases the likelihood of us intervening and apprehending the suspect. Since it's go live December 1st, 2021, we've entered 601, excuse me, we've, we've collected 601 cartridge casings from crime scene. We've had 772 cartridge casing from seized firearms, and that's generated 282 leads. This is just, this wasn't possible before. Without your support, this wasn't possible. We're vastly more prepared to address gun crime today than we were, and we're able to do it more effectively and efficiently. Axon, specifically body cameras. So as you know, all sworn personnel are issued a body camera. At first, the plan was for all patrol to be issued a body camera. Shortly after the chief's arrival and leadership discussion, uh, we, felt we, we understood the value of every officer in uniform having a body camera. So we, we pivoted and we were able to outfit every single officer with a body camera. We changed a pre-event buffer, which is the time prior to the camera's activation being recording, from 30 seconds to two minutes, the max that it could be. So at the time I pressed the button, the video is automatically capturing two minutes prior worth of video. So it shows us the, the interactions and the, and the capabilities that led up to the encounter. That's a valuable thing. We also implemented a policy change. Previously, the officers were told to activate their body cameras when they arrived on scene. Instead, now our officers activate the, their body cameras the moment they receive a call for service. And as it was explained, even if they're getting two minutes worth of steering wheel footage, I'd rather see this two minutes of steering wheel footage and not have to have them worry about pressing their button, their button when they arrive on scene than the reverse. These cameras are capable of live streaming. It gives GPS locations, which has already proven valuable in helping officers navigate through some densely wooded areas. It's, it, it's capable of signal activation, meaning it doesn't need human intervention to turn on. So whether we draw our weapons from our holster, uh, a police car turns on its lights, we activate our taser, 
it, it activates our camera and any camera within a 60 to 90 foot radius the moment one of those triggers uh, are, are initiated. Some important metrics to consider. In 2022 year to date, we've already captured over 416,000 videos. In terms of gigabytes of videos, that's 300,000 gigabytes of information that we've captured so far. For comparison, in, in 2021, we were just under 300,000 uh, gigabytes of information. So we're already surpassed all of last year's total, and we continue. We will expect to continue that trend. In, com in com uh, correlation with the Axon body cam, we've also implemented our Fleet 3 video camera. Uh, we've in installed these cameras in all 216 marked police vehicles. They're front and rear cameras. Like our body cameras, there's a two minute pre-event buffer, so to capture those two minutes prior to a stop occurring. It's capable of live streaming and GPS location. It also has signal activation, so when an officer activates their lights or draws their weapon, turns on their taser, it turns on the vehicle's camera. We have rear door activation, so if we're putting someone in the back door, it activates the camera for that as well. And it's also ALPR, automatic license plate recognition enabled. With Fleet 3, we were able to take advantage of the technology and implement automatic license plate reader technology. Prior to this, we would have to install a separate, vastly more expensive system on the rear of the police vehicles in order to capture the reads and hits. Now, with AI technology, the Fleet 3 and car camera is able to do that for us. We are able to capture reads and hits for stolen vehicles, stolen license plates, missing persons, or warrants. They're stored for 90 days in evidence.com and then purged from the system. If a hit results in an arrest or other, other evidentiary value, it's retained until no longer needed for court. It's important to note that no personal information is stored within the system. Since its inception, we've had over 1,224 confirmed hits on one of those categories. We've talked much about the need for expanded coverage and oversight of the oceanfront. Um, with our oceanfront camera project, originally in 2018, we had 30 cameras that were installed in and around the oceanfront. With this most recent expansion, we added a 42 additional cameras, giving us 72 total cameras in the resort area. This is important because with the advent of our real-time crime information center, they're also going to have additional eyes on the city, the citizens, and our officers, making everything safer at the oceanfront. On July 28th, 2022, we went live with radio encryption. At the time, we stated a number of reasons why we thought that this technology was needed and valuable. I'll give you one example of a local food line that was subject to a burglary. Our officers received a call to respond to a food line in which there were two persons who are on the roof of the, of the building. Now, fortunately, our officers were so close that they couldn't get away before they were uh, apprehended. When our officers got to them, uh, they noticed that the suspects were listening to the police radio transmissions with the smartphone application on their phones. We were fortunate in that case because I think we caught them very quickly. But as we all know, it's hard to understand what a person's intent is. It, had they had a, a different intent or a different mindset, uh, the outcome could have been much, much worse. We're also required to protect certain information, personally identifying information. That means your date of birth, social security numbers that are transmitted every day over our, our police airwaves. We're required to protect juvenile information and protect the identity of sexual assault victims. In a Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police survey, uh, 68 agencies responded and 30 actually responded that they employ encryption as well. It's important to note that these devices are encrypted, but the transmissions are still subject to applicable FOIA laws. And we are also still capable of communicating with our public safety partners. Deputy Chief Wichendahl is going to talk on recruiting in a little bit, but some of the technology that goes with recruiting, uh, we implemented Salesforce on October 21st, 2021. This, is, this has improved the communication with our potential applicants. Prior to when an applicant would apply for our department, we were, would rely on a series of spreadsheets and Excel documents, and it was often very difficult to stay in communication. We know engagement 
is a critical measure for uh, continuing in the process. So with this system, we're able to automate follow-ups to the email with next steps so they understand exactly what's expected of them. There's near instantaneous reporting for us so that we understand if there's a certain step in the, in the hiring process that's causing us a pain point and we need to devote more resources, we can address it at that moment. Uh, we're also able to capture leads, potential applicants, and automate emails to encourage those potential applicants to apply. On August 22nd, 2022, we were able to obtain a GovQA license for citizens to submit uh, FOIA requests through a public portal. We receive almost 9,000 requests annually, and this year we're on track to surpass that. We've had 6,985 requests year to date. And going back to the body camera footage, the amount of data that we have, the Fleet 3 in-car camera system, the more of those devices and the more data that we collect, the more FOIA requests that we receive. It also allows us to improve tracking with assignments and tasks, and in the future, it will allow uh, for payment on the web portal. We're, we're going to uh, now do a little show and tell with you uh, for a moment, Mr. Moss. I see you're excited. 2011, when I first got on here, that's the e ticketing first. I don't want one of those. <laughs> I'll do that with somebody else. I'm all on it. <laughs> so we are very, very close to unveiling e-ticketing. As Mr. Moss said, it's been a very long time in the making. Um, it's planned for November go live. Uh, we partnered with Tyler Brazos to implement the e-ticketing system. Um, it not only does e-tickets, but it, it does crash exchange and crash reporting. It does parking tickets, and it is automatically collects our Community, community Data Policing Collection Act uh, information. We were able to use this on department-issued mobile devices, and it's increased efficiencies, not only for our officers, uh, but our courts. For, for the thousands of summonses that our department wrote every year, another individual, sometimes two or three, had to take that same information and manually retype it into various systems, whether it be our records management system or the courts system. Well, now, with this implementation, once the officer submits the e-ticket, it's automatically entered in to not only our RMS, but the Virginia Supreme Court's database. So it's instantaneous. Uh, I know that our friends across the street at the courts are very excited about uh, this implementation as well. I mentioned officer time, and we've done a uh, tremendous job, and uh, Deputy Chief Wachendall is gonna talk about the uh, gains in recruiting. Um, sometimes when I speak with our officers, it's, it's difficult for me to say I can give you a person right away, but with this, I hope to give you minutes. And minutes at each interaction is going to hopefully end up in hours saved every week that you're available to do other things, to do other proactive policing or engage the community in positive ways. In July 2022, we began a complete wholesale uh, change of our outdated, antiquated mobile data computers. Uh, we expect that complete to be completed by the end of the year and there was approximately 320 units that we're replacing. We chose the Panasonic CF33. You can see there it's a two-in-one ruggedized device. These are meant to be part of our mobile policing initiative. So it's no longer tied to their car. Now, these devices are meant to be taken out. They can be taken out of the car as either a traditional laptop or you can detach it and use it as a tablet. They are no longer required to be uh, stuck to the vehicle to do their work. Our mobile devices, which is another uh, show and tell item that we have. Initially, with the implementation of e-ticketing, we were set to uh, deploy roughly 300 ruggedized devices. Think uh, one of your mail carrier, uh, large rugged devices that they use to deliver packages to you. Um, when we saw the estimated cost of that, and the limited usability. I say limited usability because I said 300. So not everybody would get to enjoy the benefits from talking to you. Uh, we made a strategic decision to pivot and look at what we would be capable of doing with a mobile device. We were able to do uh, all of the things that I've previously discussed at roughly a fourth of the cost. And now every officer is issued a mobile device. Every officer is capable of e-ticketing and taking advantage of the efficiencies that we're seeing through our mobile policing initiative. We're able to do uh, e-ticketing, accident exchange, uh, RMS and mobile field reporting on the devices, 
digital evidence collection. Our shot spotter uh, alerts come to these phones. We have access to Gen Genetech. Uh, we have citizen engagement tools and work-related apps uh, that we just did not have access to on a work-related device. Some of the other uh, benefits of partnering with Axon, we now have the Taser 7 less lethal devices. Uh, nearly a third of our tasers were end of life prior to uh, the RMS contract with Axon. With this, we have a Taser 7, which is much more efficient. Uh, it also includes unlimited cartridges uh, for replacement and automatic maintenance and replacement cycles every two and a half years. Axon Performance, I know we've discussed this previously, uh, but Axon Performance is a performance and compliance monitoring tool for our body camera and Fleet 3 camera system. We can write policy, but how do we know that our officers are following policy? Well, performance does just that. Uh, I'd like to highlight the over 90% activation rate that we have, and that's due in large part because our officers believe in the body camera and Fleet 3 technology, and it's also because our supervisors have the capability to monitor the compliance and understand if there's problems associated with activations. We're seeing success that uh, when I go and speak with our vendor, uh, quite frankly, most other agencies aren't even close. Uh, we also have a tool called Axon Respond that provides a situational awareness. So now, as a commander, I can pull up a screen uh, just like this and see the GPS locations of officers and their vehicles. I can get alerts for excessive speed or if they're involved in a traffic accident or collision. Uh, again, part of our uh, enhanced effort to uh, have greater situational awareness through the use of technology. With our RMS deployment, we're also overhauling our standards or our internal affairs software. Uh, they're going to provide us with a state-of-the-art early warning system and enhanced use of force reporting. It's also going to take place of our IA Pro software for streamlined electronic work workflows. So our administrative investigative process is no longer gonna be a paper folder passed down from one person to the next. It's all uh, on the computer and it's, it's streamlined and more efficient. They also integrate with our body camera and Fleet 3 videos. And finally, our records management system. It's go live planned for the first quarter of 2023. It's going to replace our outdated, two-decade-old uh, RMS system. It's going to allow us to finally get away from paper-based reports, uh, much like e-ticketing, and it's going to allow us to take advantage of our mobile field reporting. So no more three-week-long backlogs because, as you know, when you get a paper report, somebody has to re-enter that information. And when they stack up by the thousands, it can take time and we have to take priority. The moment an officer generates a report, it's in the system and available for data consumption. And last but not least on the technology, the real-time crime center. Uh, this is a, a very exciting opportunity for us. Uh, we have a dedicated space in the new police headquarters. It's going to centralize a number of functions uh, primarily monitoring priority calls for service in real time. They're gonna focus on priority one and two calls that emphasize uh, violence and other officer safety. We're going to use available resources to support officers in the field. They're gonna provide intelligence functions such as social network analysis, tactical and investigative support. So when officers are going to cases or detectives are going to cases actively, they can focus on the task at hand knowing they have experts in the background, actively monitoring and being able to provide them with the most relevant and up-to-date information. They're gonna monitor city cameras and ALPR alerts. Again, it's having another set of eyes and ears on our city safety at all times. And they're going to provide NIBINs and crime interruption support, which will assist with lead development and provide intelligence product inclusion. Informative. Thank you. Questions on technology before I ask. John, one. John what, do you, what do you think about e-ticketing? I love e-ticketing. I told you I don't want to get the first one, but I want to be there when they install it and go on the first patrol. I've been talking about it since 2011. Thank goodness for getting there. I couldn't be more pleased. But two things. I want to know what's the connectivity between the technology systems we have and the drones that we have. Is there a connectivity between the, the tactical control or is it just a passive feed of information? Billy, can you answer that one? 
Mr. Moss, uh, our, our drones, we're able to see a passive feed of the video um, anywhere on our mobile device or at a, a desktop computer. My second question is, the Brits are the most advanced when it comes to cameras and VCs. Have we been looking at AI technology to be able to have software actually analyze the video so that we don't have to actually look at that human as much like we do on other kind of systems, and then it says, oh, now a person needs to look at this. So is there an AI background to our, to our video feeds? There is, actually, Mr. Moss. So we have a separate software system that is compatible with Genetech that will allow us to feed it information and filter out certain data. Uh, if we were looking for, let's say, a red vehicle at a certain date and time and a location, uh, the system with AI uh, assistance could actually filter those uh, vehicles and point us to a particular time on a vehicle or a particular camera to help us look further at that information. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Great work. Don't stop. Okay, Michael then Delcino. Thank you, Chief Newdegate and, and Captain Zelms. I, I really am excited about the um, positive impacts the implementation of this new technology will have for safety in our community. But I guess my question is just how do we compare in terms of what other communities of our size or around the country is doing. Um, were, were we way behind before and we're just catching up now? Or are we much more advanced based on the things that you described? Kind of where are we in the arc of how we're using technology compared to other communities? We are catching up. Um, I'm very hopeful and confident by the time we bring all these to fruition that we will be leading. And that's the goal that I have tasked the department with is I want to be a leader in the use of technology as a force multiplier, not just for the seven cities, not just for the Commonwealth, but uh, as a national model. So th this is positioning well on the way. And you know, our challenge is we're going to get these uh, to fruition, and then we're going to continue to look at new technologies to make us uh, the leader in this area. Thank you. And it's just a quick follow-up, and I think you just basically spoke to that. Are there other things out there that we don't have yet that other communities are using that, I mean, I'm sure there are, right? But I mean, and so, so does this catches up to the, this catches up to the middle point. And then do we need to be making more investments in, in the future? Or is the technology still unfolding and developing and it's not ready for implementation yet? Or both? I'm getting approached with new technology ideas every day in my email. So I know that there is a number of things that we haven't even broached, uh, like with a number of areas in the police department, we just have not had the capacity to take on any new technology projects. So the goal is to get these to fruition and then start looking at what else is out there that we think would benefit the PD and the citizens of Virginia Beach. And if it, there's gonna be funding involved to come back to this body and, and make our case. Thank you. Delcina. Yes, thank you, Chief. A um, couple of questions. One is, um, I was interested in the, the numbers that you had from the, the, the gun spotting or shot spotting. The, do you have, maybe not be fair, but do you have some demographics in terms of who is doing all this, this shooting in terms of demographics? For the arrest, we can supply the arrest data. Yeah. Uh, like Captain Zelm said, you know, the arrest are just one part right. of the use of the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, like we indicated, we're only getting a 911 call 20% so 78% of the time, so yeah. so we're not getting a 911 call for gunfire activity in these mm -hmm. communities. Okay. Um, it's very hard for us to be evidence-based and data-driven if we're missing that 80% of our data set. So this helps us identify those repeat locations where maybe we need to look at additional cameras. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that we need to consider is what it does is it really builds capacity and support for the policing in those communities because we know sometimes communities can become apathetic and they think that the police don't care and they mm -hmm. don't respond to gun violence and violent crime in their community. And we can see why that they think that if we're only responding, you know, 22% of the time. Right. Now we're responding 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So that builds capacity and trust in the police in those communities. Okay. And um, regarding the video, and I know this is kind of a controversial issue about facial recognition. Do you use that technology? We, we currently don't. Okay. Um, we were prohibited by uh, the General Assembly up until recently. Right. I think this past July, they 
they switched that to allow certain departments to use it. Uh, I believe it has to go through VSP and that there is a process, but currently we don't use it. We don't possess our own uh, because it is controversial. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's something that if we decided that we wanted to use that, that we would probably want to come back to this body and have some yeah. conversation. I want the public to know what the situation was with that. And then uh, you mentioned about uh, community engagement. You said one of the, uh, I think at the mobile device, um, I was wondering what the game plan is. What sort of community engagement tools are on that and how is it used? For one, I think it's it might be taken um, taken for granted sometimes the ability to text back and forth uh, and have a known uh, contact. When our officers had their personal cell phones, sometimes it was uh, <coughs> available to communicate. I know our community liaison officers and our resort liaison officers now have assigned devices and they're able to communicate frequently with their contacts. <coughs> Secondly, using uh, the the mobile devices, we have through Axon's Capture app the ability to send individualized or community-based links to request for evidence now. So if we're at a, at a crime scene, we don't have to look for the person who knows how to download a video or ask the person to give us their, their mobile device so that we could then retrieve evidence off of it. Now we're able to either text or email a link and they can send uh, whatever evidence that they have directly to that link right into our systems. So it's just the, it's the more efficient and quicker interaction face-to-face -face, uh, and it, with that uh, immediate feedback. And I just in response to an article I just read here in the Princess and Independent News front page, and I know you just hired someone to address your communications and uh, media relations. And I don't know, Chief, if you want to bring up your new person or not, just want to hear what the game plan is to better engage our media and the, the public. Absolutely. And this is something we've actually been working on for quite some time. We, we realize that we have a capacity issue. Uh, we've had two people in our PAO now for close to a year. And they do an incredible job of one to be there to uh, interact with our media and handle that the just over staggering amount of request and one to manage our social media. So we've taken a number of steps. I think we can all agree over the last 18 months or so, we've expanded the use of our social media to put out information to the community and the media greatly. And that's something that we'll use these new devices to build on that capacity of social media. Um, we've been trying to fill Ms. Saunders' position eight months, nine months, um, because we know that we had a capacity issue. Um, we're the police. Many of us are not communications experts. We needed a communications experts. We realized that mm -hmm. to come in and, and assess how we are doing things and, and give us some feedback on how we improve. And that's exactly why Ms. Saunders is here. And I know that that's what she's going to bring to the table. But while that was occurring and knowing that we have a capacity issue, and that we can't expect one person to uh, monitor all those requests and calls seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Something that we had not had in the beach was uh, to delegate that authority to our on-scene incident commanders. They were not used to, it really was a paradigm shift. So we have brought in outside media training. Um, actually, Mr. Rob Tefano is here this morning providing additional training to some of the lieutenants and captains that we missed on the last go round, putting them in mock interviews in front of the camera. Many of them are very uh, timid. It can be intimidating, but they're getting used to it. And we expect our commanders on scene to provide that basic factual information so that our media partners have what they need. So we do have a capacity issue. We're trying to overcome that so we can, we can be better partners. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Aaron, and then John, did you have your hand up again? Okay, Aaron. Thank you, Chief Mayor Gallagher. Oh, good, sir. Good, sir. Um, thank you, staff, for, for also being here. Um, I want to publicly acknowledge your support in um, the CTEC community, where we opened up a new park and played around there. A lot of the officers were there as well. And, but even prior to that, you and your staff always having a presence there. Uh, I take my hat off to Captain O'Brien of the second precinct as well. Also, the community they have the land uh, that I a lot to the residents there. But my question is, it's centered around the third precinct. I know we, we myself, and I believe our councilman Wooten have attended um, the community, the community partnership with the DOJ. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how is that partnership going? Um, I know I'm looking forward to continuing to support that effort in community policing and building those 
relationship with our with our police department and community. So I wonder if you have an update on that. I know it's still very uh, active that we are working through establishing that council to provide guidance to the third precinct on how we improve those relations. And we're hoping that uh, what we're doing with the DOJ in the third precinct will become the model that we will replicate in, in the other three precincts. Okay. All right, well, let me know I'm, I'm here to help um, push that as well. Byron, my last question is, with so much new technology uh, coming to our department, what are the challenges are you seeing in having with being more transparent? I know some of the data out there, they're privileged, some things, um, videos, um, you can't necessarily share with the public, but just what is that like and what is what does your new community um, communications director, how does she see, um, what does she do she overcoming that, that, that kind of, you know, obstacle now with so much data, so many FOIA requests, and what can we share? what can how is she going to handle the transparency aspect of it and i think that is that is a big question that we are all trying to answer um one is we need to build capacity to be more timely and, and that is probably our biggest obstacle uh, we are complying with all those requests anybody that asks for factual information we provide of course it goes through the necessary redaction we're probably not as timely as we like and, and we acknowledge that and that's something that we've been trying to build uh you know, the infrastructure around um, most large departments our size have a, a much bigger PAO function. And we realize that coming in the door that what we have is, is not sufficient. But we really needed the right person because we do need a true communications expert. Uh, last thing that I wanted to do because, um, you know, media relations is a, is a nuanced activity. And I think the last thing that we would want to see is to take an officer that is not trained in dealing with all these functions and put them in a job that they're not equipped. Um, so one of the things that we've had to do, and the folks doing the job now are doing a fantastic job, but we've had to get them the training because you're just not going to step into the PAO office. You know, uh, you're, you're a police officer on Sunday and you walk into that room on a Monday and, and have all the answers and it takes years and years to develop those relationships and that understanding of how we, we, we and it's not just the media it's it's our community so uh, we have struggled a lot of it's been a capacity it's been turnover um but we're we're trying to solve it well thank you thank you for your service thank you all for your service as well and again uh, i'm looking forward to see how we can um replicate that, that community engagement aspect or partnership we have with doj in the third precinct yes, sir. hopefully we can get that off the ground and get it running and so looking forward to helping anyway like Thank you, Kevin. Thank, Thank you, Chief. Um, get back to the technology. And um, in my district, as I've gone around talking to people, it seems that our public safety is very good. Um, and there's just a sense, it's an anecdotal thing, but it just seems like we're on the right track there. And I was wondering with the technology, is part of it not only that we're able to you know, catch people with shot spotters and all that, but the deterrence factor, the word gets out there, hey, you're on camera in Virginia Beach, they have shot spotters. Do you sense any sort of deterrence with the technology? I think we do. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that I felt that this would be an addition to Virginia Beach you know, my previous experience. Those are deterrents. And uh, bringing that technology here is showing that, that it is working and we're gonna continue to expand on it. Um, but one of the things that we've done is really re-strategize how we go about addressing crime. We want it to be very data-driven and focused on the right individuals. We do not preach a lot of arrest. We preach making the right arrest. We want quality over quantity, and we want to make sure that we are impacting those individuals that are, you know, uh, creating and causing the crime in Virginia Beach. So we've really kind of restructured how we do things. and. Uh, focusing on the right individuals through intelligence and well my folks think it's working from from my district they really do thank you Councilman. thank you thank you anyone else john i'm going to bring up a technology which i know i've discussed with the chief before which we aren't using to michael's point probably for a later date but a big issue we hear across our communities is speeding and many communities have speed cameras, which we are allowed to do, but that's a double-edged sword, because usually the people complaining are the ones that get the ticket. 
But I'm just mentioning that because I do believe we will be hearing more about that in the coming thing. But I just want to, not asking for a comment to keep you safe and achieve. Thank you, sir. But, but that is a, a, a technology that you're going to be hearing from our constituents. That is one of the things besides just the perception of safety as you're knocking on doors is neighborhood speeding, but of course it's the neighbors in the neighborhood doing it. But I do believe we're going to hear a little bit from our constituents about street cameras. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. The social media has been fantastic, and I enjoy seeing we picked up 15 guns this week, illegal guns this weekend. And so you seem to be having a lot of success picking up the illegal guns. Can you speak to it? Or if you can, maybe you don't want to divulge how you're how you're doing that. No, exactly. It goes back to how we have restructured. When, when I arrived, we had what we called COP squads in each of the precincts, and, and we really asked them to do a myriad of things but not focus on one specific task. So we have transitioned them into what we call crime suppression squads. Mm -hmm. Instead of all being in uniform, half of those are in plain clothes, and we really uh, put our efforts on surveillance of problem locations, problem individuals. Uh, we have brought uh, both DEA, I think FBI down to give uh, these folks additional training in managing sources of information and confidential informants so that we can focus on the right people. So each precinct has a very effective crime suppression squad and their, their sole task is to focus on violent crime interruption, felony activity and illegal weapon possession. Anyone else? Chief, uh, you know, speaking as somebody on days would love my beeper back, uh, you know, this, uh, let me just say that um, I think that the work you're doing is tremendous from what I understand. You know, we had a, you know, uh, a very good summer, all things considered. Uh, feedback from, you know, a lot of the folks at the oceanfront. But, it's also the people that go to the oceanfront, not just the oceanfront businesses and things of that nature. Uh, so I think that's great there too. But uh, you know, I think uh, you know once again, as we are you know part of the seven five seven mayors getting together with the other leaders from the region, um, you, you know it's pretty obvious that the quicker you get information. You know, once again, we talked about how crime doesn't honor any border. And I, I'm going to make an assumption with this type of technology. And then once again, you know, if other departments use best practices and you're in sync, uh, you know, that could only help this situation, you know, in terms of, you know, working collaboratively, you know, to get together. Is that a Pretty accurate statement. Yes, sir. And, you know, I, I've got to thank our partners over at uh, Norfolk. Um, as we talk about crime, right after Deputy Chief Wichendall gives the recruiting update, uh, some of the things that we have had ongoing <clears throat> series of robberies and different things, it's been a joint effort with NPD uh, to help us uh, put these incidents down. So there is definitely a ongoing, renewed, collaborative effort. And the other thing is, too, uh, the Hampton Roads Planning Commission is organizing, has helped us organize with the other mayors. And uh, one of the things they're trying to do, they're trying to have um, the regional economists put together a dashboard, but they hit it which because everybody's got some different record uh, way that they record data and everything. But I'm sure that once the dashboard comes on, we start sharing the information and everything. You know, we're going to have a good collaborative effort regionally about, you know, taking some of this stuff on, combined with uh, Vice Mayor Wood's initiative of what we're all doing in the city and what we plan, plan to. You know, I think, uh, you know, we're, if, with everything, we're marching in the right direction. Thank you, Mayor. Let's finish their presentation. Yeah. Finish your presentation. Oh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, I do have to, my phone blew up because I, I did not okay. miss uh, Deputy Chief Hatfield. So uh, so I, I didn't uh, acknowledge him when we started. So Deputy Chief Hatfield was uh, recently promoted, took over for Deputy Chief Billy Dean after uh, 35 uh, dedicated years of service. He retired 
and Deputy Chief Hatfield oversees our training bureau, our internal <laughs> bunch of critical functions. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Deputy Chief Wichendall. Thank you. Welcome. I appreciate you having me. It's great. Um, so let me just address quickly the paint that I have on, since uh, nobody else has pink on. This is for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's for the community. It's the patches and the badge. Uh, I have the gold and pink badge. I have pink shoes. Awesome. <laughs> I have the uh, pink and gold badge. There's also a solid gold badge that you can purchase from an apartment member. So, again, in support of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness. All right, so I'm going to cover a, a number of items here. Speaking of I need a stool. We're going to be talking about a number of items in our recruiting and retention. Um, for those of you who uh, heard me speak at last month's OPA or some of the other subcommittee groups, um, this will be an update uh, for you. You got most of it, but we did have some things that have changed along the way. So when we, we get an applicant that comes to us to apply, there are a number of different ways that they can apply. Obviously, they can pick up the phone and call us. We're going to direct them to our website. They can stop into the Law Enforcement Training Academy in any precinct and get the information that they need uh, to apply for the process. So the first step would be for them to apply at our city's career page. The second would be to submit a waiver. That waiver allows us to run a background on that person, contact their references that they've submitted, and so on. Um, the next step would be the written exam. The written exam is held here at our Law Enforcement Training Academy. We are in the works of trying to offer an online opportunity. Uh, we're trying to work that out with the city treasurer's office as far as the uh, price goes for that. It's a little bit complicated at the moment, um, but that is our next step for that written exam, and I, I, I feel that once we do that, we're going to get a whole lot more applicants, especially some that are out of state. Uh, the personal history questionnaire, which we call the PHQ, is just before the polygraph exam. That's a, a number of questions that the person fills out prior to the polygraph. We get the polygraph exam, and then the background investigation is all returned, and it goes before pre-screening board, then goes to the chief, and the chief signs off on um, a person getting hired. They then go to the oral board. Uh, I'm, down here at the bottom, it says the physical ability test, psychological medical screenings. Those are all individually held for people that come here. We do offer those in the weekend for our outer states because we realize uh, traveling is expensive to get on a plane. Sometimes it might not be able to get here. So for the weekend, we offer those all at once um, to put them through the process. So we have taken 715 applications this year. We're on point to hit our peak of 960. And as you'll see, 48% of those are turning in waivers to be screened for testing. Those that don't turn the waivers, we are reaching out to them uh, via computer, email, phone to follow up on to see why they didn't uh, turn their application. Also keep in mind Salesforce, which Captain Zelms addressed earlier, also helps us track that information for our applicants. 75% of those who turned in their waivers and attended the test passed, which is 25% above the national average. And 85% pass rate is equal to our national average as well. So keep in mind we're all vying for the same pool of candidates in our area. Uh, really happy with this number. So for our veterans, obviously, we live in a very transit community with a large military. Uh, this year, we partnered with SkillBridge, which allows somebody coming out of the military to still stay in the military, go into our academy, and finish out processing in the military and processing into our academy. We do that through the Virginia Department of Veteran Services. This helps when they do this, this process, going into the academy and transitioning out. Sorry. The agent transition their post-service life. Because that, if you leave somewhere, obviously when I leave, um, it's going to be a big change. So for our military members, we try to get them through as simple as possible. Nobody wants to lose anybody coming through the academy if they've got too much on their plate. All right, so what are our current efforts? We go to career fairs, hiring expos, community events and festivals. We do social, social media posts, digital campaigns. Our biggest to date that's worked really well for us are referral bonuses for our officers. Currently, um, when you go in the academy after October 1st, we just had one start, you get a $5,000 signing bonus. That $5,000 is broken into two groups. You get one when you're done with the academy, and you get the other when you are finished with your PTO, your training program. We also offer a referral bonus for our officers that referred somebody into the academy, and if that person graduates through the PTO program, they get $1,000. That's a total of $5,000 or a total of ten. 
It's five. No, it's just five thousand for each. Oh, so twenty-five and a half. Twenty-five and a half. Right. Yes, sir. <clears throat> These are some of the ways that we are marketing. As you see, we have Facebook desktop, mobile, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, different types of Facebook stories. And occasionally, we tweet out different things uh, for affairs that we may be at. Um, <clears throat> our out-of-state marketing, I think I kind of covered a little bit of that, what we want to do with our written test. So our written test is, is really big. Obviously, that has to be passed. And we want to make it easier for people to take that written test. So in our digital ad, ad campaign, you'll see later, once we get that um, on board, that that will be advertised as well. But currently, look at what we have here. Directed, targeted, email distribute. 25,000 emails were sent. We go to New York, Tri-City State area. We just did one in Gordon, where you at? I'm sorry. Right. So Lieutenant Gordon just came back from New York City, Tri-City area. We've got New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York. We went up there because we didn't have the, end, uh, the testing done on the computer yet. We had hoped to, but instead we took a jaunt up to New York City. We ended up getting uh, 22 applicants, I believe. Um, two were white males, the rest were minorities. We've got 327 potential leads for perceptive officers that have been captured. And as you see from the last 30 days, 52% 50, of all new applicants have come from that tri-state area, which is pretty good. All right, the 30-30 program, 30 by 30 program. I'm really proud of this one. Something we kicked off last year with all of our women. Our goal is twofold. We would like to have 30% of our women that are going into the academy. I'm sorry, the girls going into the academy, we'd like to have 30% 30, 30 of those um, be in the academy. I don't know if I said that right. And also, we would like 30% on our department. So right now, we have 17% women and 3% in leadership, which is we are above the national with women. We're about the same with in leadership ranks. So the other thing that we're doing for the 3030 initiative that we just started, and it'll roll out here shortly, will be uh, we are targeting colleges uh, and sports groups for women. That's an easy transition. You know, obviously. Being in an officer's life is very physically challenging, so we wanted to target our athletes to see if we could boost our numbers uh, that way to get some minorities in the door. Our hiring certified officers, really happy with the certified officers. Uh, we haven't lost one yet. We've been really proud on our marketing campaign for this. October 1, we started. We will offer $10,000 to our laterals. It'll be broken uh, in, in the same fashion on different points that they get out of the academy and that they graduate out of the PTO program. We currently have two members of our laterals of the 16 that we sent, have sent through through this year. We have two that are going through what's called an option five academy. Um, previously, DCGS has gone back and forth over the years on whether we can take out-of-state applicants or all in-state. So option five will be for out-of-state applicants. So they have to meet our criteria uh, DCGS has to vet them, make sure that they have more than two years on the previous agency they came from, and that um, the stuff that they have from their academy, most of them are post to DCGS, kind of align with each other. So we'll send them to the, the Option 5 Academy. This just started, so we're sending our first two. They're in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, and then we will be the southern tip for the next future um, Option 5 Academy. So we're really excited about that because it gives us an opportunity to get uh, a lot more people through the option five. It's really expensive to send them, obviously, if you get a hotel, food, all that, to send them to Fairfax. We will do that here, and we'll have that in-house. Uh, those that are going through right now, one starts in November, plus these option five will be sometime around December graduating. <coughs> the certified officers are great because they're all done through word of mouth. Um, we have taken a number of our employees from Norfolk. Um, there's a core group of five that came from Norfolk, and they speak very highly of our agency. Yes, the bonus is great, and the bonus is a boon, obviously, cash-wise, but what is drawing people here in a lateral program is they're allowed to keep their seniority from the other agency. If you have 15 years there, you get 15 years here. Shift bids are very important to officers. That happens twice a year, and they bid to see what shift they're going to be on. They're not rotating shifts. You can pick day shift, evening shift, uh, or midnight shift. So... That seems to be the biggest draw that these certified um, like out of it. Some of our incentives, um, I'm not going to cover all of these. I just covered some of them for you. Um, we have a number of different career paths. Um, I'm told from all our laterals that we have probably more units and more things to do once you get here 
the, the options are endless for you. So there's 40 plus career paths, that's actually pretty good. Promotional opportunities are very good as well. Um, I want to mention, um, you already see our city benefits. Everybody has the same city benefits. I want to mention our college credits down at the bottom. So we got with a few colleges. Um, we asked them to take a look at our curriculum, our academy, academy curriculum. They look at that, they evaluate it, and they say, we'll give you X amount of credits for college. Virginia Wesleyan is paired with us. They're giving 32 college credits. That's for classes that you have taken while you're in the academy. They'll give up to 42 for other classes. So if you were a drug recognition officer, uh, you might get a sociology class. So they evaluate your training record and then they'll tell you what you have. Our bottom line for supervisors to apply to be a sergeant is 60 credits. So you can get 32, 42 just by going to Virginia Wesleyan. In Virginia Wesleyan, uh, probably in the next coming year, we will have a Virginia Policing Institute partnership with Virginia Wesleyan. So just a number of things that we are um, creating. TCC also works with us. TCC will give us about 23 credits um, going through their process. Avent University of Liberty, it's not an ad for them, but just the one, some of the ones that we do. And you look up there, you get it, where's that, Brad? Um, stipend for degrees, I want to mention that too. So you get pay, obviously we just did the pay pan, you get longevity. And you also get different stipends for, depending upon whether you have a bachelor's degree, master's degree, or associate's degree, which is very important to officers. All right, so this last class that we just started, we started with 47, we are down to 45. That's actually pretty good, starting in August, that we're, we're about a month and a little couple of days afterwards, and we've only lost two. And those were, of those two that were lost, they're personal choices. Um, personal issues where they wanted to go back, either where they came from, or this just was not the job for them. We do get a few that come in there, they spend a week or two, and it's just not for them, and they move on. So we do a police academy twice a year. We're looking at doing three smaller ones um, in the future if we can. Uh, that's yet to be determined. We need to get through the changes that we have with a couple different things, and we'll evaluate that and see if that's a possibility. Smaller academies work a lot better as well, um, especially for the recruits. You can give them a lot more one-on-one -on -one attention. Uniforms and equipment's provided each recruit free of charge, and the recruits have over 1,000 hours of training. DCGS does not require 1,000 hours of training. That's what we give. Uh, we go above and beyond our partners in the other cities on what we give our recruits. So we give the core group of DCGS objectives that DCGS is asking for, which is around 450 or so, and then we top that with all our other classes. So it turns out to be 1,000 hours. I think it's 960, actually, um, around there. All right, so I kind of already covered this when I got ahead of myself, but... Um, I'm really proud of the certified hires, if you see, so. Um, we hired 16 and 22, and two of those, as I told you before, in our Option 5 Academy. Hopefully, uh, in January, when we do our Option 5 Academy, um, I hope to have more than four or five in there um, that we've been able to garner. Can you, can you just explain certified officers when you say, when you say that? Oh, certainly. Um, certified and lateral, kind of interchangeable. Um, if you are with another agency, we can bring you over here if you are in state and you have a DCGS certification, then we will put you into an academy here, which is modified academy, it's not the full academy. Um, less than two months. Academy graduates, these are already certified officers. Certified officers in another agency oh. that ha are switching over here um, to come here. <clears throat> of the 16 that we just took, um, they have over 100 years experience. Um, probably our highest is maybe 16 years. Right. And then uh, we have 11 additional certified that are currently in the process, and I kind of outline that in the next January Academy will have a few. It does not include the two. So you can see here on our campaign for do more, have more, be more. We have SkillBridge. We have five active duty members in that process right now. Our cadets, um, make you familiar with our cadet program. It's something that we have started, I think, since I was at pd &T, which I left there in 2001. We've wanted that for a long amount of time, so we finally got the funding for that. We can take up to 20 cadets. Those cadets are learning on the job, police work, ride-alongs, um, community service opportunities. They're working in our precincts. They're coming to do PT um, on the weekends. Uh, a lot of things that are keeping them integrated, so that's between the ages of 18 and 21. We don't want to lose anybody. I mean, it's really to the point where we need to keep them engaged here so we don't lose them somewhere else. Uh, it gives them a, a taste of police work. 
The other opportunity that we have for this, even though we have six active, three are currently in the academy, is that we've had a couple that have come here from different places. Uh, they're not certified. They're leaving one job, and the next job for the academy is in January, let's say. So if we get somebody at the beginning of December who now does not have a job, but they want to go in the January Academy and they're slated to go in it, we will hire them as a cadet to keep them here. It's a part-time job. Um, that's another opportunity that we have to keep everybody engaged in, on our department. So the digital campaign, I've already talked to you about that. We're focused on our lateral officers. We went up to New York City in the Tri-City area. Uh, Lieutenant Gordon went up there, as I explained, the numbers that we got from there. New York City has always been fantastic for us. Anytime we've gone to John Jay College, Monroe College, um, any of those, the officers like to come down here. I guess that's Thank you. Any questions at this point? Aaron. Um, there, I have just a few questions. The written exam, the physical test, when was the last time they were, they were updated? It's been a while. It's been about 15 years. So we're in the process of doing a transportability study, which will evaluate that physical test and the validity of the written test. Okay. So they are there every 15 years? There's no schedule for it. Okay. Yeah. I'll we, we want to change the physical physical test at this time, so we have to do a transportability study. And, then, and the written exam? Same. Same exam. Same thing. Great. Thank you. And then, I, I just for, you know, I'm just curious. The polygraph test isn't always admissible in a court of law. Why do you all do polygraph tests for part of uh, your hiring process? So a polygraph is a tool for us to use. As I told you, they fill out what's called a, a PHQ. It's a questionnaire. And we go based off of this, and we, we want to weed out those who aren't being, or being less than truthful, not honest with us. If they fill out that they've had no drugs right, in the last five years, um, that PHQ where they say they haven't had any, we're able to see if there's deception. It gives us an opportunity to question them further um, to elicit that information. So it's just a tool for us to use. And um, prior to coming on the police department, we, we do that for our civilians as well. Anybody that's going to be in the police department working around uh, money, drugs, things of that nature. So it's just a tool for us to, to utilize. And my last question is, there's your 30 for 30 program, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. Amazing. You have 17% of women right now representation in ranks. What is the, rep what is the percentage of minorities in rank, representation in ranks? So I think our, uh, not in ranks, our African-American population is about 7%, and I think there are two African-American supervisors. So what, Thinking what in my brain. In ranks? What percentage-wise? Yeah. Are we doing it throughout our entire, you want our entire numbers for like what's already in leadership or overall? Yeah. Because it's going to be different. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm curious in. I wonder if we could develop or come up with a plan to have more, not just women. I think that's a great, great model, uh, mm -hmm. but more minority representation in the ranks and leadership. Councilman, the best way to answer that is not enough. So the, the numbers are woefully lacking. We realize that they're lacking. Uh, the challenge for policing in general is just trying to bring quality, qualified individuals to fill the gaps we have. Uh, so it's it's been a struggle to concentrate on minority recruiting exclusively uh, when we, we find the ourselves in the place that we've been the last two years. Sure, but the ones we have are there already. What is their years, I guess, and we, I guess you can get this information to me, yes, but their years of service and what is their promotional um, record looks like. I think, um, you know, just as important it is to have more women in, in ranks and in that representation, I think is also important um, that we have more minorities uh, in ranks and representation as well. Since a lot of the communities that we are trying to recruit community policing in, it will be helpful if the community can identify and relate with someone who looks like them that's also in rank. Yes, sir. And uh, I've met with our African-American officers. I meet with them uh, almost quarterly, and that's one of the conversations that we have. They are heavily encouraged to please try to take these promotional tests so that we can get... Uh, more of our minority officers in our promotional ranks so that we do reflect the community in a number of different capacities. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, Rosemary. This is exciting to see all that you're doing with promotions, and I think, I mean, and recruiting, excuse me, and, and I think in the past we've always tended to bring a, a lot of 
uh, uh, officers from the New Jersey and uh, and that area. And this 30 by 30, it, and Shannon, you're will be a, a great role model for that 30 by 30 program. And, and I do agree with Mr. Rouse, we do need more minorities to reflect uh, our own demographics. But we, as long as I've been on council, we've always had a big shortfall of, of officers. And I know even that shortfall, the number of officers that you <coughs> aspire to have, uh, Chief, is even greater than that. So where do we stand on our numbers right now? We have currently uh, 75 vacancies. That does not include the 45 in the academy because I'm very hesitant to include those in our numbers because unfortunately we've had about a 50% attrition rate in some of our academies. So we don't really want to include them until we know that they're going to graduate. If all 45 of those graduate, that vacancy number goes down to 30. That, that's what we're hoping for. But I also caution that that gets us back up to the 787 because we have uh, converted some vacant sworn positions for some much needed non sworn positions over the year. That's better than any year that on council is fantastic. Keep up the good work. Uh, great. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I'm going to yes. talk about the crime. <coughs> Okay, yeah, let's go ahead. You know, at this point, I think you had an outstanding presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. All righty. Um, at this point, any council liaison reports? Okay, how about council comments? I just, had a, I just had a question of where we are on um, doing the uh, getting the public engagement piece ready for Rudy Loop. So I think staff is in the process of selecting a facilitator, and then once they select a facilitator, you're going to start meeting with the community on what next steps look like for that. So, do we have a timeline on that? I think that's really important to all of us. I'd really like to get moving on that. Thank you. Okay, Aaron and Guy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, really quick, as you all know, I'm, I'm myself and Council Member Miles is our liaison for the Minority Business Council. At the prior meeting, we discussed um, there was a presentation done by school board on all their contracting and minority participation and the dollars that we allocate to the school board. Well, they don't track um, their participation of minority businesses. So with that being said, we had a brief discussion. I myself and I'm sure Councilman Miles will, will co-sponsor a resolution coming forward to include the school board um, in the disparity study, which we've already uh, allocated for within the budget. And so that will be coming forward um, once the legal team gets it uh, back to us. And that way we can track um, the dollars as well when we, when we allocate it over. As you all know, we can only ask the school board. <laughs> Uh, we can't force them to do anything, but I, I would be hopeful um, that they would um, take part in this disparity study uh, going forward. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. In, in the nature of, a, from my standpoint, a council liaison to the Resort Advisory Commission and also the council comment in general, uh, I wanted to report that uh, Councilman Berlucci and I had discussions about the further discussions about the task force for uh, implementation of uh, cannabis legislation in the state so that we could have a more um, uh, activist, if you will, approach to this, uh, trying to stay, at least keep up and stay ahead where, where it's necessary and reasonable. Uh, in, in that regard, uh, we've had discussions with uh, the city attorney's office about drafting a ordinance to create a workforce, uh, excuse me, a task force for, for this purpose. And uh, I'll, maybe Councilman Bellucci could add. Thank you, Mr. Tower. I know we're short on time. I would just, I would add that I'm very pleased to work with Council Member Tower on this initiative. He raised this issue at a previous workshop and, um, and and elevated the concerns that were being expressed by some in the resort community 
And I think we all agree this is a citywide issue. There's a lot of great opportunity available to our community as a result of the changing laws and perceptions around cannabis. And there also could be some um, challenging aspects for every aspect of our community. And I think what we're asking to do here is establish a task force that will consider all of that and develop a plan that works best for our community. So it really is, has been nice to work with Mr. Tower and um, also uh, with Mr. Stiles and his team. And I look forward to bringing something back that we can talk about as a group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. I just, just on that issue, can staff give us a report in our next packet of what the laws are in the Commonwealth? They're very confusing to me. Kind of like you can do this, but you can't do that. And I'm not sure what the legislation is requiring. Uh, Staff is in the process of preparing two reports based on the last time we talked to council. One is on the current law enforcement activities and rules and regulations around enforcing um, the decriminalization, that may be the wrong way of, a, of saying it. And also staff is also preparing the, um, the other opportunity about possibly dispensaries and what the impact that can have on the community should that come into effect. From our understanding, this on the dispensary side, the state has not taken any action officially yet, but there has been conversation that's been going on about ideas on what that could possibly look like. I think staff is also in the process of coordinating with the, the state cannabis czar, for the lack of a better word, to come and present some of the council to get a, give us a better understanding of what's in the hopper on the state side. And I think that person is also tentatively acknowledge that they're willing to um, meet with the public as well and answer some of the public questions, which could then be a good um, segue into council's future task force should council move in that direction. I appreciate that. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, yeah, just very quickly, um, last Saturday, um, Patrick Dehaney and I were uh, speakers at the Virginia uh, um, VML uh, Mayor's Association. Topics of conversation, very interesting, crime, intercommunal uh, council relationships, civility and continuing relations uh, com uh, and uh, noise and short-term rentals. And these were even cities of a thousand or more. <coughs> so once again, there's a lot of commonality out there about what even the big cities are going through. Yeah, John. Two items. We did finally close out the comment period on noise. So the staff will be looking at all those comments. We're looking to hold the, I guess you'd call it a early afternoon and an evening session on Thursday, November the 10th. That's tentative to collect feedback from everyone else. We'll be able to put it out with plenty of time for people to digest that and work with staff. Secondly, this term of the Supreme Court, I think they're already were hurting the affirmative action case, which will really influence minority contracts and what we legally do based on that opinion. And then, of course, there's the Alabama case. So I would just ask the legal staff, as those oral arguments are completed and the transcripts are available, I'd like those to be shared with the council because those have meaningful impact on two things that we fundamentally do and could possibly change how we do business. Okay. And that's the two items. Okay, thank you. And at this point, if we can get into a gender review. Okay, so four and 12 have to be pulled as they are speakers. And it's my understanding that Mr. Moss and the manager agrees that number 12 would be deferred indefinitely. Okay, that's is, it. Is there anything else that anybody... Could you say that again because you kept four and what are... 12. 12. Four and 12. Yes, sir. I have a sub... Deferred indefinitely. <coughs> but we have to hear it because there's speakers. Yes, I have a substitute motion for six to use the TIP fund in lieu of of the ARP money to fund the repair. I'll talk about that at the time. Okay, great. I'll pass it out. That's it, Mr. Okay, Moore. at this so point. Does that mean you need to pull it? Yes. Okay. yes. You add on. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. You told me I wouldn't forget, and I did. Uh, everybody at their place has um, a, a resolution to for the, uh, declaring an emergency, state of emergency. We need to do this as an add-on, so we'll need to do this first. And then we'll add it on to consent unless anybody has a problem. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to research, uh, re recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions of the open meeting allowed by section 2.2.3711A, Code of Virginia, submitted for the following purposes public contract discussions 
of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds and discussions in terms of the scope of such contract. And where the discussions in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2 37 11 8 29 Atlantic Park Project publicly held properties discussion or consideration the acquisition of real property for the uh, public purpose or disposition of the public held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiation strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.237-1183, District 6, Formerly Beach. Legal matters, consultation with legal con uh, counsel employed or retained by the public body specific to legal matters requiring the uh, provision of legal advice of such uh, counsel pursuant to sections 2.237-1188, and that's Washington Square, which versus City of Virginia Beach. <coughs> Executive session confidentiality requirements and personnel matters, discussions, considerations, or interviews <coughs> candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, promotion, salaries, disappointing, or resignation of specific public officers, uh, appointees, or appointees from uh, any public body pursuant to section 2.2. Uh, uh, 3711A1, and that's council appointees, uh, council boards, commissions, uh, committees, authorities, agencies, or appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. okay. Councilor Belushi? Aye. Councilor Brown? Aye. Councilor Henry? Aye. Councilor Holcomb? Aye. Councilor Miles? Aye. Councilor Walls? Aye. Councilor Morales? Aye. Councilor Morales? Aye. 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 Okay, folks, at this time, we'll research an executive. If you can just take a very short break. Uh, yeah, I'm saying a short break, grab dinner. So I was going to say that.